So I'm going to do, um, I want to talk a little bit about some weird stuff with radicals, which I don't love and I wish wasn't the case. And then we're going to deal with some, ret well, maybe we can start with the retrosynthesis that we finished with the last class, circle back to some weird stuff with radicals, uh, which is in the assignments. I want to thank um, Megan for sending a ridiculous number of really intelligent questions, which I think can form the base of this if we don't have other ones that come up because um, they're all really good and um, she's right, they're confusing. And so they're all good examples to go over. So I think we can start with this. So I would consider this a fair final exam question. And it's hard because what you need to do is you need to think about multiple steps, how you get something to happen. So, did anyone give this an effort? Try it out. Okay. So, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to remember what I've drawn. OK, so I'm just drawing these on opposite sides of the page. And what we want to do is, I probably should have drawn the other way, is we want to go from here to here. Now, when you're given a question like this, um, it's it can be really tough to figure out where to start and how to start. Uh, Madeline, I might. Amanda, you do not need to worry about fish projections. I think I said that you're not going to be responsible for the mechanism of the ozonolysis. Um, I think that's it. I think you need to know everything. Um, and Madeline, I might not have uploaded it yet. I'll check if I haven't. I'll make sure to upload this immediately afterwards. It takes some time to process after class and I get distracted um, and then I wander off. So I'll stop recording here and I'll upload it during office hours. I'm going to hold some office hours immediately after class for people who have specific questions. OK, so we need to go from here to here. Yeah, well, so we can do that, right? So that's a good idea, Melitza. So Melitza says, well, hey, what if I take hydrogen and palladium and I get rid of the double bond? Cool. Uh, not like first of all, not a bad idea. I got rid of the double bond. The problem is, how do I introduce an iodine at this position now? So this is where I want to introduce an idea of functionality. So when we um, are you uh, so Alyssa asked, are we responsible for the palladium and linear mechanisms of all kinds? No, not the mechanism, but you need to know how it goes. Well, any question? Um, midterm be multiple choice like they were in previous years. Now, everything's going to be short answer. Uh, I don't know if we do any multiple choice. No, I think everything's going to be short answer. Uh, do we have to do an antimeric excess? No, you do not need to do calculations of an antimeric excess impurity. Yes, we're never, we're not going to have to do any math. Uh, antimeric copper copper of HI, yeah, you absolutely need to know that. Uh, we covered that last class. We did HPR, but same thing for HI. Oh, that's how you get here. Well, it says what you're saying. Yes, you need to know it, and you're thinking about using that. Okay, yeah, that's well. There's no double bond, so you can't do an antimicrophonic off. There's no double bond. But what I want to point out here is what uh, Melitz has kind of gone to, which is. 
this idea of functionality and functional groups. So we've been calling this thing functional groups. What the fuck is a functional group? It's not a carbon hydrogen bond, basically, or a carbon carbon bond. And what we've done a lot in this class is we've interconverted functional groups. So SN2 reactions, right? And SN1 reactions are you take a leaving group, like a functional group, and you replace it with another functional group. Uh, all the addition reactions we did to double bonds, where you took a double bond, which gave you a functional group on two adjacent carbons. Both carbons were part of that double bond, and we could selectively add to one side or the other side of the carbon if they were an asymmetric double bond. And then we can make double bonds from other functional groups. Yeah, so you can use any reagent you want to get from here to here is the point. So Melitza said, well, we get rid of the double bond by using palladium and hydrogen. That does. The problem is, is that we now no longer have any functional groups we can use. We still have a fluorine, but the fluorine is there untouched in the end, and it doesn't really help us. Whereas what we probably want to do is conserve this double bond functional group and see if we can migrate it. We want to see if we can use that functional group to introduce the new functional group. So Melitza said, um, so anti Markovnikov of HI, and she's right. So a good way to make this guy, and this is a retrosynthesis zero, so this means comes from, would be from that, right? Because we can go, I'm just going to delete this big arrow down here. We can go forward by doing an anti Markovnikov addition of HI, right? We want to do anti Markovnikov because we want the iodine out on the end. And to do that, we can use something like AIBN and HI and some heat because we're going to add it anti Markovnikov. Uh, we couldn't, so this is saying we couldn't do an epoxide reaction, right? Um, you could, you'd have to switch out a few things. Because an epoxide, so another, what we could do, there, there's no right answer. There are, there are lots of right answers. There are also lots of wrong answers. Another option from this could have been, we could have made an epoxide. So let's do MCPVA. So we get an epoxide. The problem is if I open an epoxide, right, I'm going to have an alcohol left over. Um, this one's a little, you know what, you can, and I'm thinking about drawing a reagents for this, but they're not reagents we've used in this course, so I'm going to avoid it. Um, there are ways to go to this in three steps. But they're a little extra steppy, because when you open an epoxide, again, oxygen here and you get your nucleophile at the other site, so you add two things. One thing you can do is if you add like lithium aluminum hydride, which we've seen as a reducing agent, to an epoxide, it acts as a nucleophile. The problem is it's going to go in the wrong spot, so we'll get OH and H. Because it acts as a base, and so it does an SN2-like reaction on an epoxide, like a nucleophile attack, and nucleophiles under basic conditions attack the least hindered side of the epoxide. Right, so um, Megan said, why not use BH3, sodium hydroxide, hydrogen peroxide? Uh, you're, um, so, and then Melitza said, well, wouldn't that add an OH? I, I love this conversation. You guys are doing this absolutely right. This is exactly the way I think about it. We're going to run out of space. So I'm going to delete this. So let's use Megan's conditions. She's not, you're not off base. You can get there from here kind of thing. Because again, what you're thinking about is where I want my functional group. And so if I use your conditions, we'll get that. Now that's not an iodide, but can I turn it into an iodide? Yeah. So there's a few options. One is, you know, you can cut, you can't do an SN1 on that, right? Because it's primary. 
it would be nice to protonate it with H plus, have it leave as an, as an electrophile, and then have iodine come in. You can't do an S and one node because it's primary. Um, what we what I recommend, and I have this in the lecture notes, is we use one of these reagents that allows us to turn alcohol into a leaving group. And so if I haven't, I know it's in the assignments, and I know it's in the lecture notes. So we have these reagents. They're called sulfonate esters. I'll just draw the simplest one. The mesolate. We'll draw out the mechanism for this in a second. So we can use this mesolate. What what the what the fuck is that? Okay. What that is, is if I have R, I'm just going to actually skip to the next page. I'll come back to this. I'll do a little sidebar on this. I'll come back. This is actually kind of useful to use. Um, by the way, if you look up any chemistry and it like works, it's like real legitimate chemistry and it's something I haven't taught in this class, you're very welcome to use it. If you're using it to solve problems, and it's like, hey, that's a useful thing for me to be able to switch between stuff. Uh, go nuts. It's an open book exam, so you're welcome to do that. I wouldn't rely on it because you need to look stuff up now take time, but. I'm not going to mark you incorrect if you do stuff that's above where we're at to solve problems. You don't need to. Everything can be solved with the chemistry we have covered in this class. Um, but still, so by base often it's a midazole. Why? Because a midazole is a shitty base and all you need is a really shitty base. And so mechanistically what happens? Nucleophile attacks electrophile chloride leaves. And this is why we need the shitty base because we need something that's not going to cause us any grief. Now we've installed a really, really good leaving group, but something that will sponge up this extra hydrogen and that's what the missile is going to do. Thank you, missile. OK, what I want to do is talk a little bit about this. This is also called O R. O M S for methane sulfonyl. 8 methyls methane sulfonate, I guess in this case. It's a good leaving group. Why? The nucleophile comes in. You make that. There's a lot of oxygens there. And it's not resonance per se, but there's a lot of pseudo resonance going on. And if you think sulfuric acid, we think it's a strong acid. Because it is a strong acid. Right, and it's a strong acid because it dissociates completely in water. To give that notice it's the same function, right? It's it's the same functional groups. These are very stable. So you can do this to turn an alcohol. OH is not a leaving group. But you can do this to turn an alcohol into a leaving group under basic conditions. And so if we take Alyssa's strategy here, we can do an anti Markovny addition of water followed by activation and turning this into a leaving group and displacement with an IED nucleophile. That's fine. That'll do it. I'd still say one step is better than two, but full marks either one of those answers. So Alyssa's, um, sorry, it was Megan's idea. Alyssa says, why can't we just use H plus for this to leave? It can't leave because it's a primary carbocation. Um, and I think if you used if you used neat hydrogen iodide for this, by neat I mean no solvent, just hydrogen iodide. Iodine's a shitty base, so you would protonate it, and then the I minus would come in and displace the water. And since there's so much HI, the water wouldn't come back and displace the iodine. 
So if you used, I'd also accept. This is better. But we could just use HI. I'd accept that as an answer as well in this case, but not through an SN1. It would be through an SN2. Can't do SN1. So we have three ways to do this one step. But in all cases, what we've essentially done, right, is we've taken this car. This was the only carbon that was functionalized. And now both of these carbons are functionalized. OK, but this isn't that. So any suggest we can work both ways into the middle or we can go one way. Your brain, some of your brains will go one way. Some of your brains will go both ways and either one's fine. Any suggestion on how we can start closing this gap a little bit further? And you can sort of make use of this idea of the, of the functionalization of dull bonds. Melitza says add a halogen to the tertiary carbon on a double bond. Absolutely. So this could come from. I don't know. What's your favorite halogen, Melitza? So how do OK and then and then you can make that from another double bond is what she's saying. Right, that's what you had in mind. Cool. OK. So. Um, Melitza's rushed through and done two steps, one after the other here. How would we go forward from this to this? So I think what you need to identify is what is the reaction that's occurring? What is the reagent that would accomplish the reaction you want? Exactly, it's an elimination. What kind of elimination, Samantha? Are we doing a Hoffman, a Zaitsev, an E2, an E1? Right, right. We're, we're trying to create the most. We want to create, we want to access the easiest O bond, the easiest, most accessible proton to get that. So we want to do a Hoffman elimination. Um, in general, if you can avoid SN1 and SN, uh, SN1 and E1s do because they're kind of uncontrolled, you got a lot more control with SN2 and E2s. So we'll use potassium carbonate in terputanol. Sorry, not potassium carbonate. Potassium terputoxide in terputanol. That's one of our Hoffman bases. If you left off the terputanol, I wouldn't care. Um, but that's going to deprotonate the most accessible proton. And then how do we go from here to here? Right. This is just a Markovnikov edition of HBr. So HBr, right? Nothing fancy. OK. So what we've done, if you notice, right, is we've wandered from having this carbon functionalized to passing through this carbon, and now we have this carbon functionalized. And now we share a carbon. But we still need to pivot this double bond. How do we know if it's E1 or E2? You don't. You could use either. You could have used an E1 reaction here. It would have been completely appropriate to just do 
terbutanol and heat. And that would have been an E1 elimination. This would have been, sorry, this is not, I'll, I'll draw a different color alternative. But under strong base, you're doing E2s. So in a in a Hoffman elimination, you always you're using big bulky bases by definition. That's what a Hoffman elimination does. So you're always going the big bulky base is the big fat cat trying to get through the skinny little door. Uh, if you've seen the cat video. Which I have been told in this class is the only thing that makes any sense. So if the big bulky base, it's going to grab the proton that is most accessible, the easiest one to get. And the easiest one to get of all the protons attached to the adjacent to this carbon is the CH3. It's a Hoffman because if you did a Zaitsev, you wouldn't get this double bond. Right? If it was a if it was a, um, a Zaitsev, I would expect you would have eliminated towards the fluorine. Like if we. If we used a Zaitsev base. Not one of the big bulky ones. We would have eliminated towards the fluorine because you can imagine this hydrogen here is quite acidic because if you have a partial negative charge on this carbon, this fluorine can pull electron density out of there by induction. And if you think about hyperconjugation and that kind of stuff and the most substitute double bond, this double bond and double bonds want to be more substituted because of higher hyperconjugation and stability of the pi electrons. And the fluorine's got sp3 orbitals. And so I guess in this case sp2 because it would do resonance, but it's got orbitals that can involve in stabilizing this double bond. And so the double bond would prefer to be next to the fluorine. Uh, so Melitza said, do we need the slash salt alcohol? No, I said you don't. You can skip it. It just always is there because it's always there. Yeah, OK, but even if we didn't have the fluorine there, Hana, we would the Zaitsev would then give us sort of a 50 50 mixture between the other two carbons. But it still wouldn't give us the most accessible carbon. OK. So. How do we close this gap? How do we pivot the double bond? We only need one more structure. Oh, Alyssa's got a question. Yeah, go nuts, Alyssa. Sorry, I'm just confused as to what is going on in the, the structure on the right. Like, why did you do that first? First. Uh, this guy? With palladium, yeah. Oh, um, because Melitza asked about what if we add palladium. Oh, OK, OK. So this okay. this is a dead end. OK. This was a failure and took us nowhere interesting. That's why. Sorry. Okay, so that's not a reagent that would be useful. No. It would not be useful, but In it is a reagent that does something. OK, but that would just be from the last structure, like going to the product, right? Yeah, that was well, that was from the start. So what we're doing here is I said, make this from this. So this is the product. This is the starting material. OK, so the products on the far left, it's just we're showing what you can do with these is um, we'll often say make this from this and you can work either way towards the middle. Okay. And you're doing that consciously whether you think about it or not. Like we're already thinking, OK, I want to be moving my functional groups towards where that double bond is on this thing. Like that's why we start moving everything up instead of towards the flooring and left because we wanted. Yeah, the. Um, the right thing. OK, got it. Thank you. So we, we've got a gap here. 
uh, with bromine again, anti Markovnikov, right? So if we take this guy, let's take another bromine. And I completely agree because we can do this anti Markovnikov, right? If it was Markovnikov, the bromine would be here. So it's anti Markovnikov. HPR and light. OK, this is the one place where I had to be very careful with how I made my molecule uh, and ask the question to bridge this one. Uh, yeah, Olivia, I can do that again. And actually, that was one of the things I was intending to because Megan asked a really intelligent question on that. Uh, yeah, that's probably a very good idea. Yes, yeah, we, we need that. Um, OK, so how do we? What do we need to do here? Uh, we need to make a radical. Drake, otherwise it will do. Um, our coffee cob addition. Yeah, we need to do an elimination. And it doesn't really matter what kind of element, like the, either Zaitsev or Hoffman would work, right? So let's just do a Zaitsev elimination for shits and giggles. And I'll draw my little guy with no arms. All right, it's like a guy because he's got like two legs and a head, but no arms. Okay. Um, why does this go towards that product and not back to the starting materials? I actually spent some time thinking about this to make sure this worked. <laughs> so essentially I'm asking, why is this green hydrogen more acidic than this orange hydrogen? Because we want to take the green one off, not the orange one off. OK, um, Christian, you're right. Why does that matter? So Christian's right. It's because the green one's closer to fluorine, but why does it matter that it's closer to fluorine? Induction, right, because what it does when you pull off an H plus, that's what acidic means, right? You're left with a C minus. And having an F nearby is going to pull that, stabilize that C minus by induction, whereas at the top you don't have that. So on this side, you've got an F near the C minus, which is going to help it do induction. So this would be the answer to the question. If the question said provide a retrosynthesis, this top line up there would be the answer. If it said provide a synthesis, you could resketch these things with these arrows and these reagents that we have right underneath, and that would be the answer. So, what we've done all the way up to this point in this course is talked about concepts, you know, first month or so, then started talking about stability and reactions. And the reason we did that wasn't because I like giving you a long list of reactions. Um, I don't particularly. That's why I spend so much time talking about stability and trying to draw connections. But it's so that we can do things like this. We can make new molecules. Like this is how we make drugs. We think about what is possible, how we can stabilize intermediates and help get one thing from another, and use a series of individual steps to convert something into something else, into something else, into something else. This is how every single drug is made. Um, this is what I do for a living. Solving puzzles with reagents and seeing if it works. OK. Would a retrosynthesis require reagents? No. Uh, OK, so this is said, so induction is dominating sterics. This, this is the same. There's no difference in the sterics, really. 
they're both, both of these hydrogens are on tertiary carbons. And this is actually more sterically hindered because it's got the ethyl group. So if anything, a base is going to prefer to deprotonate here a little bit. How we create a bond with a lesser acidic hydrogen if we needed to? Um, you, we haven't covered that yet. We're not going to, so you don't need to. You're not going to be asked that. How many questions like this are going to be on a final? One. One's enough. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to ask you to do something you can't do. Uh, so let me rephrase that. I'm not going to ask you to do something that you haven't been provided with the tools to do. Uh, you might not know how to use the tools, in which case, not my problem. OK, um, I got a question about the whole anti-Markovnikov mechanism thingy. This slide or this one? Like this retrosynthesis one? Oh, this one. This was basically saying we have a way of turning an alcohol into a really good leaving group. This equals I minus in terms of leaving group. Well, no, it's it's more like a bromine. I always think of it as a bromine. It's a good leaving group. Um, actually, if you replace the CH3 with the CF3, that's trifluoromethane sulfonate. It is the best leaving group known to man. Um, that that is stable. So it's a triflate group, and it's abbreviated OTF instead of OMS. So if this is a CH3 or CF3, this is equal to triflate. And triflate is a much better leaving group than iodine. Triflate is the the Ferrari of leaving groups. It leaves if you look at it the wrong way. So this is actually so we can turn an alcohol, which is not a leaving group, an OH. It is not a leaving group into a leaving group. Now you can do that by just adding acid, turning it OH2 plus, but then you have to add acid and that's not always what you want to do. So with this, with this with this route of adding one of these sulfonates, you can gently turn an OH into a leaving group, and then you can do E2 and SN2 chemistry on it instead of adding acid and hoping you do SN1, E1 chemistry. Yeah. That's exactly it, Amanda. It's for activation of the leaving group. It's for turning an OH into a leaving group. Okay. So let's say we had this question and it was HBR, AIBN, some heat. Does this work for kind of what you want to do? I'm scrolling back up, Olivia. Do you want me to add some resonance to this? Yes to resonance or just yes to the basic example? Any other opinions? Either works. Um, you know what? I think I want to point something out. So I'm going to kind I'm going to I'm going to fuck with your minds. So we're going to split the difference. We're going to do something that looks like it's going to do resonance. OK, because if let's just think for a second about the Markovnikov addition here, OK? 
So before we do the anti Markovny cough, let's just run through the Markovny cough edition. Let's say we had HPR as just Markovnikov. Hopefully at this point. You're thinking, oh God, I know how to do this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And you put the positive next to the fluorine because the fluorine can do resonance in this case. Yes, it is inductive and yes, induction wise is pulling the positive out, but it can donate by resonance if it's right there. And it is right there. So you get the resonance. Which also tells you that the fluorine must be SP2. And then Br- minus comes in as a nucleophile. We're good, right? So probably if you're thinking about it's almost like a pattern I think you'd be stupid and none of you are not to have noticed. Whereas if you have a heteroatom single bonded to a double bonded carbon, it's going to participate in resonance. And so the charge is going to go there because you can do the whole resonance thing with the lone pairs on the heteroatom. It's really tempting to fall into that trap with the resonance with the radicals because you think, OK, radicals, carbocations. John said they're kind of similar. Uh, I'm going to think similarly. OK, so let's just keep that in mind as we do this problem. So uh, we take AIBN. And again, just. On the basis that drawing something often enough can nail it into your head. I, I kind of believe that. I think there are things. For, because we're masochists, uh, for fun, we get together and try and figure out mechanisms of reactions that have been reported, and it's not clear how they work. Um, so I'm always practicing drawing these kinds of things, and I think there are things where I have no idea how it works, and I start drawing it, and it all kind of comes together. So sometimes stuff is in the hands and not really in the brain. Anyways, you add heat. This is your activation step. In your initiation step of a radical reaction, how you know it's a radical reaction? There's AIBN there. There wouldn't be AIBN or benzoyl peroxide if it wasn't a radical reaction or light. Light, AIBN, benzoyl peroxide are your little. They're, no, they're not. They're not little signs. They're flashing neon bright. Blinding signs saying radicals, 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 radicals. Because that's the only reason they'd be there. Anyways, initiation would be when you take a radical and you make a radical that is involved in propagation. Looks for the weakest bond. Unsurprisingly, it's something involving a halogen. Almost always something involving a halogen. If there is a halogen around to be involved in. Bromine. Okay. Now, the bromine radical is going to react with this thing. We have two options. Right, the bromine can go on the same carbon as the fluorine or it can go on the opposite carbon as the fluorine. Which one do you think we get? I'm going to call them A and B. And why? OK, 
OK, so on Melitza's question. Uh, so while people think about this. Oh shit, that is not going to be good. Plug it. OK, I'm just going to draw us at an odd fucking angle, but I'll, I'll survive. No. Uh, so on Melitza's question. Uh, do we have to draw the resonance on the blue one? No, you don't, but you need to be able to draw the right product. And if you don't draw the resonance, you need to know that there's resonance. As long as you know and you understand that that's what's happening, you're fine. Especially if I ask you to draw the, give me the product. But if I ask you to draw the complete mechanism and justify it, then probably at least saying because resonance, even if you don't draw it, would be important. Okay, so the consensus seems to be A is better. Why is A better? I think you're all agreeing. I don't think Olivia is saying that F is a radical, which is that it's next to it. Both secondary C. A is better because of resonance with F. Induction. The radical is... So Hannah, that is a wonderful way of not answering the question. I, I do applaud the effort of saying something is more stable because it's more stable. So I'm going to... I'm going to come back to what Faith said. Both are secondary carbons. It's absolutely correct. A is better because of resonance with F. Let's be very careful about that because you're wrong on that. And so we have induction. Is induction important if you don't have a charge? There's no charge on that radical. The answer is no. Induction plays no roles in radicals. Radicals are neutral. They don't give a fuck for your induction. You can take your induction and stuff it. They don't care. They what they want to know is they want they like hyperconjugation. They love resonance. Um, that's what they're interested in. So induction is not a good enough argument. OK, let's think about the resonance thing for a second. And I said I was going to trap you and I told you I was going to trap you and then you got trapped. Do you want to play poker for money? I like you. OK, so if we're going to do resonance, the resonance you would draw. Would be. That. Like that's the resonance, right? One electron, one electron resonance bar. I don't know if the bar was necessary. I am obviously very excited. This is probably a better representation of my normal level of excitement when I'm lecturing um, than anything you guys have seen. I, think I feel my normal level of energy for the first time this entire semester right now. It's been a depressing semester. Um, what's wrong with what I've drawn there? There, Faith. Uh, I, 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 I think your number is wrong. But your idea is right. You want to redo your number of orbitals? How many orbitals do you need? Do you need nine? So Melitz is going not possible. It'll create more than an octet. Faith says nine orbitals, which is incorrect. Five. Five orbitals. That's exactly it, right? So two orbitals for each one orbital for each lone pair. One orbital for the sigma bond, one orbital for the pi bond, that's four orbitals. And then another orbital for that lone pair, like for that lone electron. Um, our, our hand only goes to four because we don't have thumbs. So, no, no, bad, bad, kill with fire. Or apparently with. Anyways, so resonance, bad idea. But, Hyperconjugation, good idea. So these are both secondary carbons, as, as people have pointed out, but one's got a fluorine on it and the other one doesn't. And so even though this is only a secondary carbon, it's a secondary carbon with three atoms attached to it that can do, that have SPX orbitals. And so the fluorine can also participate in hyperconjugation.
So the one next to the fluorine is the best one, but not because of resonance. There is no resonance. Resonance is not possible because of hyperconjugation. So we just spent a lot of time thinking about this particular issue, right? Um, and I have really fucked up the amount of space I have to work with. But, um, no, no, I just fucked up the amount of space I have to work with. There's not a lot I can do. This is propagation. So I am going to redraw my propagation on the next page. Bromine radical. Now let's draw it before the arrow. It'll be all fancy like. Wee. Okay, just what we drew on the last page. I admit this is a little sloppy. And then this is going to react with the weakest bond around. The weakest bond around, of course, being HBr, because HBr is always the weakest bond around. And so what we've done is we've done an anti-Markovnikov addition of HBr. Now we can draw termination steps. I, in this case, I literally just can't be asked to draw termination steps because it doesn't matter because this is my product. And I'm an organic chemist, so I really care about the product. And so it's, it's, I think it's only if I ask you specifically, please provide, like if I say, provide me the mechanism leading to the product, well, you're done. You provide the mechanism leading to the product. If I ask you, please provide the mechanism for all radical mechanisms, please list initiation, propagation, termination, then I guess I have to do termination. So let's do termination. I'm going to grumble. My, I have a border collie. Uh, I think he's shown up maybe for one of the lectures. And Finn has figured, I, I didn't name him Finn. You know, he goes to doggy daycare and half the dogs there are named Finn. It's not a good name for a dog. But anyways, um, Finn has finds new ways to vocalize, but they're all ways to grumble. So I think this tells us that the urge to bitch about stuff is a universal urge of mammals. And his life is really good. He gets free food, uh, all the couches he can sleep on. It's a lot better than what any of us do. You know, he's never overtired because he gets a nap all day. Our pets definitely run the world. We just do what they tell us to do. So again, I'm drawing the three termination steps here. There are three ways that these things can come together because there are three different radicals present. Anyways, I'm I'm really sorry about the. Sorry, so Samantha, hyperconjugation does, induction does not. Induction plays no role. Hyperconjugation definitely plays a role. I like to think I'd never confuse those two vocally, but I probably did because I just got too excited and started yelling. OK, so we have the termination steps, but the termination steps are kind of irrelevant. They don't matter. That's not what the product is. Product is in propagation. Was, my handwriting is even worse when I'm writing at an angle, so I apologize for that. Product is in propagation. It can be like a new Buddhist mantra or something. So. I have no idea if I answered your question, Olivia, or if now you're more confused than when we started. Mm. 
You want to let me know? How do we know when halides con uh, contribute to contrib con uh, hyperconjugation? So, Melitza, halides always contribute to hyperconjugation. Um, normally, though, we don't necessarily consider them very much because the effect, if you have a halide attached to an atom and you're talking about anions or cations, like positive charges or negative charges, the hyperconjugation effect is normally swamped by induction or resonance. So if it's a positive charge, you're never going to think too hard about the hyperconjugation because you're going to be doing it by resonance. You're going to be doing it by conjugation. So the halide is going to do it by resonance. It's going to stabilize that positive charge by resonance. That's so much better than anything else, right? Like a primary carbocation stabilized by resonance is pretty damn good. Like it's the only one that's even worse than a tertiary is the owl one. And that's because it's primary carbocation and primary carbocation resonance. But a primary carbocation in resonance with a with like I'm I'm using a lot of words and I'm waving around and I can draw on paper. As we've discussed, this is the only bad re like resonance that's worse than tertiary. Every other resonance is better than tertiary. But you know, a primary carbocation with a fluorine on it. better than tertiary carbocation. So you never even think about hyperconjugation, you don't get to there. And if you have a negative charge on the carbon and you have a heteroatom on it, it's hauling density out by induction. And it's the, indu it's the important type of induction because it is right on that carbon, hauling electrons out. And so you never get to hyperconjugation there either. So Allergens are always involved in hyperconjugation. It's just not normally part of your decision tree when you're dealing with charges. When we're dealing with radicals, it is because the induction thing doesn't matter and they can't do resonance because you run into this five, five orbital problem. So there, their hyperconjugation matters. And they have hyperconjugation because they have sp3 orbitals. That's all that's required, and they've got them. That help? Cool. Okay. Um, last example I want to do is actually a direct question from Megan, and it's because you're going to see this, um, and it's slightly confusing. In lecture 29, I was wondering why the major product was ethyl hash and the bromine dashed. Um, OK, so if you uh, you if all of you guys can click on Alyssa's comment in the chat and see what she's seeing. I'm pulling it up. I'm not sharing that screen. So we had an iso. We have what the question has is we have a radical adjacent to an isopropyl group on a tertiary carbon and we have bromine bromine on it. And Alyssa saying why is the bromine down in the major product and up in the minor product? Well, the question is, the where does the BRBR BR want to approach from? So that radical is in actually in a P orbital. Why? Because I can get all the other electrons that are paired up down into SP2 orbitals then instead of up in SP3 orbitals, and I win the game of electron minimization. Like if I can. Having a single electron in a p orbital and three electrons in sp2 orbitals is better than having four electron, uh, all the ele seven electrons in sp3 orbitals. So it's six in sp2, one in p versus seven in sp3. Anyways, so it's in a p orbital. So your bromine br br can approach from either the top face or the bottom face. So Alyssa, which face do I want to approach from, considering I have an isopropyl group on top? Yeah, so we want to approach from the back because you've got a big fat isopropyl group blocking the front. So the bromine comes in from the back, which pushes the ethyl group up. Because there's only. Four directions on a tetrahedron. 
And so if Brom is in the back, the ethyl must be in the front. Does that help? Yeah, perfect. OK. This was on one of the assignments. And there's a worked solution, but I do want to discuss it. This is photolysis cleavage with light of a halogen with an allylic system. That sounds awfully specific, and it kind of is. Um, so this is associated with the free radical halogenation that we did at the very beginning of radicals, where we would take, you know, something like this, treat this with chlorine and light, and the light would break up the chlorine, the chlorine would react with this, and we generate a single chloride on this. Now, it's really tempting to look at this and go, ooh, double bond, anti-Markovnikov addition of chlorine, which, of course, would just be CLs on both of them. Um, that's not what happens. And I think it's got something to do with the way that you use the light and the ga chlorine gas to generate energy radicals of specific energy. Um, because if we did this with HBr, AIBn, and heat, we would do an anti-Markovnikov addition of HBr, and we would interact with the double bond. We're not going to interact with the double bond directly. What we're going to do instead And of light, you get chlorine radicals. Um, this is actually why you chlorinate your swimming pool outside. You put chlorine in there, there's sunlight, it slowly cleaves your chlorine gas into chlorine radicals. Your chlorine radicals then attack the cell membranes of bacteria and fungi and all sorts of things, and chlorine just fucks them up. Um, it also fucks you up, which is why you shouldn't spend too much time in your bath or in your swimming pool without washing off the chlorine afterwards. You're protected because you have this thick layer of stuff that isn't really alive on your skin, whereas bacteria and fungi don't have that protection. You get to the single cell organism and you kill it. Um, but for, yeah, chlorine free radicals, way we clean swimming pools. Regardless, um, there's no activation step because we're immediately making the radical that's going to be involved in propagation. So initiation is when you make a radical involved in propagation. So you could label this as in initiation activation. So if you want to, if you, I'm fine with this. If you want to define activation as making two radicals out of zero radicals, and initiation is making a radical that's involved in propagation, then you should label this initiation activation. It's both. Um, but you won't find many textbooks talk about activation. It's, it's kind of a, Trantism, because I think these are two separate concepts and they throw them all under initiation. Then we have two different types of initiation. And I don't, I just don't believe that. So I like separating these terminologically. The epistemology of organic chemistry. Okay, this is just where shit gets weird. Okay, what I want to consider is the stability of a radical. Because we've got, remember, radicals really like being stable. And actually, the question I've got for this is why doesn't it, I, and I don't actually have an answer for you, is why doesn't this happen with the anti Markovnikov competition of hydrogen halides across all bonds? And I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Okay, so let's consider two options. Let's consider three options where we can have this radical attack. It can attack the double bond. So I could get this radical. I could get this radical. Or it can grab this hydrogen. This allylic hydrogen. It's allylic because it makes an allyl group, which is three carbons with double bond in it. And it's going to be cations, anions, or radicals, but there's resonance. That's the whole point of the look. And in that case, what I'll make 
is this radical plus HCl. Which of those is the most stable radical? Yeah, the third, because it's in resonance. The third radical is in resonance. So it's the most stable radical. So when chlorine has this option, and again, I don't understand why this doesn't happen with the anti-Markovnik competition when you have HBr or something like that. And when you add heat and AIBN, it does behave differently. I think there's, so I don't think we fully understand the mechanism because I think I'm lying to you somewhere in the mechanism. I just don't know where there's something else going on. This is just pure radicals floating around. You generate the most stable radical. The most stable radical is that. Okay. Now, this is where I got a really good question on the uh, from Megan because the assignment says I'll tell you what the answer is that this then reacts with chlorine from this radical. to give, not that, that, that's impossible what I just drew. To give that, plus a chlorine radical. And so we've regenerated our chlorine radical, we're good. That's the propagation. Okay, so, couple things here one is wait what the fuck um if i'm looking at those radicals i'm thinking the secondary radical is the more stable radical right if i have my choice between these two radicals this one is more stable because it's secondary it's not primary so if i drew if i follow the analogy from carbocations that should be the reactive site that should be where the reaction's happening at the secondary site. Why the fuck is it happening at the primary site? It should be happening at the secondary site, but it doesn't. It happens at the primary site. And this is because we need to be very careful. This is where the analogy between radicals and carbocations breaks down. Okay. So in resonance, remember, resonance means it's not these are interconverting, right? It's that these are both descriptions of the true nature of the system. We basically have three atoms that are sharing two electrons, or three electrons in this case. Let's ju I'm just going to draw the carbocation version up here for an argument's sake. I guess it wouldn't be a negative nucleophile, it would be a neutral nucleophile, but still. My argument holds true. Nucleophile would add at the secondary site. Still don't understand why hydrogen can react with the chlorine. Um, why not? Like, I can generate a more stable radical that way. I always want to generate the more, the radical I'm stable generating is a carbon radical. And I've got a choice of three carbon radicals. I actually got more choices. And I'm going to break the weakest bond I can. And the weakest bond I can leads to the stablest radical, plus has to be a weak bond. Carbon carbon double bonds are very weak, so those are good candidates. Um, a carbon hydrogen bond isn't particularly weak. Which I think is maybe where you're coming from. It's like that's actually a pretty decent bond. Why are you breaking it? Well, I can make a really, really, really stable radical. That's why. And that weakens that carbon hydrogen bond because I can make a stable radical. Also, when do we know when to look for the hydrogen? I know, Melissa, I think I completely understand and I agree with you. And so what I, what I'm going to say there is when you have a halogen alone 
and light, that's when we're not looking at the Markovnikov. We're going to be looking at these kinds of allylic halogenations. This is these are conditions for free radical uh, free radical halogenation. And if you look in your textbook, there'll be a section on free radical halogenation. Uh, it's actually quite a large section generally, and then a little bit at the end about anti Markovnikov additions to all bonds. I've kind of inverted that. I spent a little bit more time on the anti Markovnikov additions to all bonds because that's actually useful. This is normally less useful because it's normally pretty uncontrolled. Um, so when we have light and halogen gas, that's when this stuff occurs. But wouldn't a double bond be faster? Which is a great question. No, it's not. And it, it, it jumps to mind thinking, and, that, and that's because you're thinking, hey, the double bond is a weaker bond. But it's not. That carbon-hydrogen bond is particularly weak. It's much weaker than normal carbon-hydrogen bonds because the radical is so stable. And so the transition state of that transformation is quite low. Ionically, it's high. That's a hard hydrogen to remove using a base. But using a radical, it's a very easy hydrogen to remove. It's a different mechanism. It's a different type of reaction. It's a different activation energy. So Melitza, yeah, only when the same halide is bonded together. You know, if I had two halides bonded together, um, I could see the same argument there. If it's no, if it's HV, so it's light, Halides. That's when you have to watch out for this. OK, I want to come back to this thing down here. Now. Remember what the resonance means. What we're saying here is the nucleophile attacks this carbon because delta plus, small delta plus. Nucleophile goes where most of the positive charge is. The more stable carbocation is where most of the positive charge is, so that's where the nucleophile goes. We don't have a charge with the radicals. So what I want to think about is just as a question. Which of those products is more stable, the navy or the orange? Yes, Madison. Yes, Alyssa. The H halogen you can't do photolysis with. HBr you can't break that with light. Uh, you need too much energy. You, like again, there's something particularly weak about heteroatom heteroatom bonds. So you need a heteroatom heteroatom bond to really do that. Blue, yellow. Pink. Lauren, Melitza, you sound more certain. Faith, you have a question mark, and so you sound less certain. And Alyssa's wrong. Right, OK, Melitza, you're bam, bam on. That is exactly the answer. The blue is more stable because no bond has got more carbons attached to it. In every other case, all the other bonds are about the same energy. The only thing that's different is dull bond is more substituted in blue than orange. And Zaitsev eliminations happen because you make the more substitute double bond, because the double bond can do more hyperconjugation because there's more carbons and atoms with sp3 orbitals next to it. It's a happier double bond. Blue is more stable. OK, so blue, that check mark should probably be blue. So if blue is more stable, and you have a resonance structure leading to it. Do you think the transition state leading to blue or orange is lower?
So I think the question I've got for you then is, is the energy of this, maybe I can uh, reduce this question down to what I'm really asking. Is the energy of this lower than this, or does that question make no sense? I'm coming here, Melitza. I'm coming here. Because it comes down to this question. I disagree, Hannah, which doesn't make sense from what I just said, but I disagree that this one is lower energy than this one. I would argue that this question makes no sense. Why? Because those are resonance structures of each other. I, like we can compare and say this resonance structure is lower energy than that resonance structure. But the reaction doesn't react from one resonance structure or another resonance structure. The reaction reacts in a resonance hybrid, which is a single energy. Like we can look at these and think, why is this a good stable molecule? Because it's got a nice stable resonance structure. But the energy of the molecule isn't divided between the resonance structures. The energy of the molecule is the energy of the molecule. This molecule isn't flipping back and forth between these resonance structures. It is a combination of the resonance structures and it has a set energy. Right? It's not changing between the resonance structures. The resonance structures contribute to the energy of the molecule. OK, so if we agree that the blue product is the more stable product, we agree that the starting material leading to orange and blue is the same thing because it's the resonance hybrid. Which one's going to go faster? So let, let's just draw this out on a reaction coordinate diagram. Starting material, which is the resonance hybrid here. Blue product is more stable. Orange product is less stable. We've agreed on that. Which one's going to have a lower barrier? Faster is whichever has the lower activation energy. Exactly. So under these conditions, which one's going to have the lower activation energy? If the starting material is the same energy, there's actually really normally only one answer on this. Because the it's it's a radical reaction, it's diffusion limited. By definition, you're going to be slightly lower for the blue. So the blues form because the transition state leading to it's lower because it's the same starting material and it's the same reaction. It's not like these are different reactions. It's radical combination. It's a radical reacting with chlorine. And radicals are really reactive. They don't care a lot about sterics. Sterics are a little bit different. It doesn't really matter for radicals. They don't give a shit about sterics. It's leading to the more stable product. And it's because here's where the trap happens with radicals versus carbocations. With the carbocations, we identified the more stable resonance structure when it reacted like that, but it wasn't because it was the more stable resonance structure. It's because in a resonance hybrid, the more stable resonance structure is putting more positive charge on that site. And it's the electrostatic interaction between the nucleophile, which is negative, and the carbocation, which is positive, that makes the bond. And it's much more likely to do it here than here because there's a lot more positive charge at one site than another. Whereas for the radicals, there's no charge. There's no electrostatic attraction. And so the bond that forms is the one that leads to the more stable product. And if that's not a mind fuck, um, I don't know. But if you understand that, you get all this. Because that that's all this is, right? All we're talking about is what is the reality of structures, where are charges at? And with radicals, we're thinking there are no charges. And so reactivity is driven by stability of the molecules. I think I'm comparing uh, I'm comparing the idea of this resonance hybrid with the resonance hybrid of these radicals, and I don't actually know how to draw a resonance hybrid of radicals. 
like there's a half radical on both of those carbons, but what's half an electron? I don't know, about 50-50, Stephen. Do you get a question or not like this? It's in the assignment. Let's work through. It's a fair question. It's only quasi-evil. If you understood what we were just discussing there and why, why this happens, then you've got it. Um... Oh, okay, so Madison said, why do we know it's going to react with that hydrogen, not another one? No other hydrogen on that molecule would have given you resonance. You can take off any other hydrogen on that molecule, and there's no resonance possible. And so it's not particularly good. The only reason it reacts with that hydrogen is because of resonance with double bond. Can I go back to your question? What was your question, Melissa? I can't. I think we're now firmly into the office hours component of this course because uh, we're way over. When do we know that a primary radical is better than a secondary radical because it goes against the primary versus secondary rule we learned? OK, so a, pr a secondary radical is always more stable than a primary radical when we're talking about distinct species. But we're not in this case I have on the screen. These are not distinct species. These are resonance structures of each other. So they're not it's not a primary radical and a secondary radical. It's a primary radical in resonance with a secondary radical forming overall a resonance hybrid. But if I have a distinct primary radical or secondary radical, like a nice simple case where we don't have to deal with this resonance shit, HBR, breathe a sigh of relief, I am drawing AIBN, eat, uh, blah, 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 mechanism stuff. Um, you're going to come to a point in drawing your mechanism where you have a choice between that or that. Those are not in resonance with each other. That is a primary radical or a secondary radical. Secondary radical more stable. That's what that's what forms. But in that last example, it wasn't a distinct primary radical and a distinct secondary radical. It was a resonance structure. No, you don't like radicals. Nobody likes radicals. I, I fucking hate radicals so much. I actually will make it click in, in, in our lab. We'll try and go out of my way to not use them if I can think of a good way to avoid it because I just I don't like the way they look. They make me squeamish. Just like I don't really like the color brown. Anyways. OK. I think we have actually completed all the course material. Um, we've addressed all the lectures. I can do some more. I can. I'm basically just going to run these as more retrosynthesis questions. Uh, I'll keep doing retrosynthesis questions until you know the cows come home. Do examples from assignments or anything that anybody asks uh, for the next two classes before um, the final. The assignment goes live at midnight tonight, but it's it's office hours. Anyone has questions? I I am going to stop recording and then I'm going to start recording an office hour session.